be good to see you. Again. Good to be here. Yeah, there's a lot of water is going under the bridge and so forth, and it, I'm going to be really interesting to get your take on things. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. you've been busy, I understand. Yeah, uh, I've uh, been working with a law firm for a couple of years, DLA Piper Rudnick, the right, third largest law firm, firm third yeah. largest in the country. Is that the largest? Third largest in third. The, in in the world, actually. We've got uh, the firm has 2,800 lawyers. Holy I left at the 2800. end of uh, 2800. Holy I, I left uh, at the yeah. end of August, but it was a great experience. It's yes, a terrific indeed. firm. And welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations, where it's a great uh, honor to welcome to the program uh, Hugh Price. Hugh Price probably needs no introduction. He was a long time. He's going to go into some detail of it. The, the president and the chief executive officer of the National Urban League, a uh, leading civil rights uh, organization. He's a lawyer. He's got a distinguished career that continues, and Hugh Price really is a great pleasure to welcome you once again to great conversation. To Thank you. <coughs> we were, you were, I guess, in the past, uh, I was just discussing, we had watched you, you had had a program with our, uh, Mr. Hefner, Richard Hefner, right, which was very well line. done more right. recently. But I wonder, maybe we could, we want to pick up some of your, your, your takes on the society nationally and in the world sense, but maybe you could anchor it a little bit, if you could, on your own personal background. You were, you were, uh, you were born, were you born uh, and raised? I was sort of uh, born and raised in Washington, D.C., right. went through the public schools there, mm -hmm. got a B.A. from Amherst College and a law degree from Yale, mm -hmm. started out as a legal services lawyer, and we were in New Haven for a number of years and moved to New York City in 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, when I became a member of the editorial board of the New York Times, uh, okay. we moved to uh, the place where we now live on July 18th, and I went out on strike on August 9th, and that was my welcome to New York City in you 1970. You went out on strike at the place you, you remember were living? The big, no, oh, the I strike in the New York oh, Times. You remember the big right. newspaper strike I in 78? I don't remember. How did it come out as far as your interest in Well, about, three, about three months later, we all went back, but uh -huh. it, was, it was my welcome to uh, yeah. New York. Well, um, welcome to the barricades of New York. Huh? Yeah. So I had uh, five and a half to six uh, terrific years uh, on the editorial board of the Times and was with public television for another six years. Was senior Overseas, vice president. Senior vice president. Saying. Overseeing all the national production there, great performances, American Masters, Nature. You were involved with American Masters? Yeah, it got started on my watch. Good Susan, for you. Susan Lacey. This well, I mean, good for the producer. Uh, yeah. Brilliant producer started the program. She was on uh, Richard Hefner the other day. Yeah, Susan she's Lacey. terrific. She's and terrific. That if I may, this is, is too late to do it, but maybe it isn't. Uh, the series that uh, Scorsese put together on Bob Dylan right. is going to air tonight another, at 9 a.m. production AM. this fall. Yeah. Too, yeah. too late for you all to get it, but it may be a follow-up. It'll probably be repeated Part at some one point. of a four hour thing. It's an amazing yeah. series. It's Public yeah. television is wonderful. It's a great, it's a great service, yeah. and it was a joy to be part of the industry. After that, I went to the Rockefeller Foundation as vice president for six years. Uh -huh. Had a terrific time in the grant-making area in education and equal opportunity, and mm -hmm. then the opportunity knocked in the summer of 1994 when I was asked to become the president and CEO of the National Urban League. Uh -huh. Did that for uh, <coughs> nine years. It was the job of a lifetime. Yeah, I had, absolutely. I had come of age dreaming of having an opportunity to do something like that. Right. I got to do it. Help a lot of people get into the mainstream and get the that society was, structure that's, that's to allow more good people to get there. It's the mission of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if a good editorial board, New York Times, responsible right. uh, programming development at, at uh, WNET or uh, National Cable, I mean National Public Television. Right. Those are two ar areas of uh, uh, helping to shape the public opinion contest mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, you, you've been involved in trying to help shape public opinion in terms of your mission in life, as it were, or were you on the business side, or how? how I was did on you the uh, editorial, editorial or substantive side. side. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I've yeah. always been interested in public issues, mm -hmm. and um, whether I was in the media per se, as mm -hmm. I was in those two instances, yeah. or when I was with the Rockefeller Foundation, mm -hmm. and obviously when I was with the League, mm -hmm. I wrote a lot, so I published many articles. Yeah. Uh, op-ed to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal Absolutely, and uh, yeah. Phi Delta Kappen and many others. So I've always been interested in trying to express my views and share them with others. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you did your work in law. and uh, Yeah, I lasted about 18 months in law uh, as a lawyer. So <laughs> and, uh, I'm a very, I'm a notoriously lapsed lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. And uh -huh. He always said it was a good avenue to things in general. It gives you language, it gives you context, it gives well, you an idea of some of the basic grounding systems it gives you the that structure our society. Well, let me, tell you, no? let me yeah. tell you what it also does. Oh. It gives you the tools to analyze new situations. For example, when mm -hmm. I became the head of national production for Channel 13, I didn't know anything about television. Right. So I had to diagnose what the terms of success in that position would be. Mm -hmm. um, and how I could help the enterprise be successful. So it was a problem-solving yeah. exercise. What's mm -hmm. the field? 
what are the issues, what are the terms of success, and how do we win? And that's the way lawyers are trained to think about new issues and new opportunities mm -hmm. that present themselves, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a new job or a new case that you're presented with. I guess it does give you language. Then it, you've got statues, and we've got structure of the society. We have uh, statues, and we have a constitution. We have certain you know, principles, and then we have precedent, and we have common law, the principles we've inherited from Britain and so forth. And in the whole, and we talk about uh, a society based upon the rule of law. That's a very important principle but in terms mean, of, no, just uh, you know, that can be grounding for holding on to important values. It also right. can be a context that hopefully will allow uh, the society to merge with the technological and cultural change that is inherent in the historical But think about process. it as a thought process as okay. well. Mm -hmm. An editorial mm -hmm. for the New York Times is a mini legal brief. Yeah. T t t wh why, what is it? Here's an issue. Mm -hmm. These are the arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. This is how we weigh the arguments on both sides, and this is the conclusion we reach. Mm -hmm. That's the way a legal brief is structured, mm -hmm. laying out the problem, sifting the evidence in the arguments, reaching a conclusion, and presenting them. And so again, even in a technically a journalistic position, yeah. the legal training was enormously helpful. Yeah, it does. You have the idea of precedent, and there's the idea of history. And and various interests yeah, have but to also serve, the weight yeah. of evidence the weight of the weight evidence, of evidence. Yeah. how substantial is the evidence how credible you is the evidence you have in the law the period of discovery so that you can discover the realities that exist in terms of the issues so they can what be are the arguments presented. what are the arguments i've heard yeah. some people say we got three branches of government but the media writ large is in a certain sense a fourth almost a fourth governmental or a fourth influential avenue if you take all of the media i guess you take print radio television all that it's a fourth and I think Thomas Jefferson said it'd be better to have a free press without a Congress or a legis uh, government than to have the other way around. Yeah, I, I don't think of the media as an in, you know a branch of government. I certainly no. think of it as an institution and part of the core infrastructure of our society. Okay. And heaven forbid we should not have a free media. It's obviously mm -hmm. hugely important and yeah. has been through the history of our society. You think it's becoming more so through time as they get new? I mean, we didn't have radio and then we had radio and then yeah, I think it's. I think it's now the uh, internet. You know. I think it's m more so because there's so many outlets. I think the biggest challenge for citizens. Mm -hmm. is to learn how to parse what they see. Um, you oh. know, it used to be we would rely on certain institutions, be it the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the, the three major network anchors to sort of tell us how to think, yeah. and we trusted their judgment. More information is coming raw at us, yeah. and we have to develop the capacity to sift raw data mm -hmm. and reach informed conclusions and not just rely on somebody else to say, well, trust me, this is the way it is. No, I don't, we don't, we shouldn't trust people to tell us the way it is. We should develop the capacity to weigh the evidence. I'll give you an interesting example. Please. When I was at uh, Channel 13 in mm -hmm. the uh, mid-1980s, we, one evening we ran two documentaries on the wars in Central America, El Salvador and Nicaragua. Yeah. The two documentaries used 80% of the same footage. They were prepared yeah. by people who saw the world in diametrically opposed ways. Same footage? Same footage. <laughs> so we ran the two documentaries back to back As a, with a com yeah. commentary up front. Mm -hmm. we, we, the citizens, are going to have to learn how to weigh evidence mm -hmm. because sometimes it won't you be self-evident. You did it as a media experiment. As an experiment That's to great. show people mm -hmm. how you can see the same stuff and reach different conclusions yeah. and how they had to develop the ability to make judgments did you, did you? That's a thing that could be done. Really. Did, you, <laughs> did, you, did you insist that the producers each had a different view on the thing, use exactly the same footage no, these, or, or these, edit from footage? These were, these were documentaries prepared by separate entities. We, we found out about the documentary, uh -huh. and uh -huh. when we screened them and discovered that they'd reached opposite conclusions yeah. using the same material, basically, yeah. we said, yeah. isn't that fascinating? That is So let's run them side by side, yeah, or just one on top of the other. In order to let the audience learn let how to look at how a film. Look. Yeah, that's and important. how to weigh what they see. I remember I did a program. You remember Vance Packard? Yeah. He wrote The Hidden Persuaders. Yeah. It was alarming how closely the advertising industry could know how many cornflakes they're going to sell by using a red box rather than... I mean, we got the reptilian core. We got all these fears, and they can manipulate the emotional nature of people, you know, with great well, their uh, job uh, precision. Their job is to sell. Yeah, their job is to sell, and they, and they, they could be they selling ideas. They rely heavily on the field of psychology to help them figure that out. And so does the political process and everybody. the business. Of, I guess it. I guess it's all one seamless. The spinmeisters do. 
I think good. the spin meisters do. Everybody, yeah, you know, tries to use as many tools as they can. That puts mm -hmm. even more of a burden on individual citizens yeah. to figure out what's coming at them. Yeah, and we're getting more, and, and we're getting more and more information all the time. Yeah. This information yeah. overload might be able to present. Uh, they had a uh, um, what was the name? Uh, Norbert Wiener one time said, "Information right. overload load in a system permits pattern recognition. You begin to see patterns mm -hmm. and be able to see." systems or comprehensive well, understanding of a process rather than a specialized but one. But the main change is mm -hmm. that we're getting raw data. So mm -hmm. the information that used to come into the news desk of a newspaper be filtered by a, a, a reporter, yeah. editors, senior editors before uh -huh. it goes out with the imprimatur, right. now just comes raw. Yeah. So uh -huh. there's no filtration process, there's mm -hmm. no analytical process in the stuff that comes over the internet. On the internet. Uh, yeah. And increasingly on some of the political screeds that come at us. So I think we we'll get some of, of that on public access, I think. Probably. Because it's probably. open, it's Hyde Park it's Corner it's notion, you can say anything you just want. Whatever, so you whatever television, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the internet yeah. particularly, yeah. yeah. And so that changes the dynamic, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it changes or the duties of citizens. Of uh, in 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 educating themselves to the reality, and and therefore yeah. it places an even greater premium on the educational process to help people think critically, think critically, and parse yeah. what they see. Yeah, which probably would have been good all along, but it's particularly More almost important. crucial now in More the modern now world. Now now yes. And that's something that's of interest to you, as well as the basic grounding policy statements and so forth right. by which the society organizes right. itself. Right. Yeah. Well, I think one of the main issues we face today, and Please. I think the reactions to the, and lack of reac adequate reaction to the hurricane down in New Orleans has Wouldn't driven it driven it home. Yeah, um, we have to begin to ask ourselves: Are we one nation, or are we a splintered nation? Mm -hmm. Are are all Americans in the same tent with us? What are the shared values that we have? I think we've become so divisive, so ideological that there's a risk of fissures developing within our country and. Katrina really drove home for us that, uh, you know, it's the duty of the public sector and the duty of all of us to be our brother's keeper around certain kinds of common issues. And I think we'd lost sight of that. I think we'd become so self-absorbed, so focused on our own well-being, so focused on our own needs and problems that mm -hmm. we tended to try to uh, push others into the, the background <coughs> and, and lose <coughs> sight of the fact that, that they're there and they have needs. So I, I think mm -hmm. there's a welcome conversation beginning in this country, and Dick Hefner and I talked about it on the, on the, the open did. mind, um, about the need to revisit the social compact between our society and, and its people, and particularly the have-nots of our society, the yeah. working people of our society, mm -hmm. who really are struggling, and I think we've just, uh, they've dropped off the public policy radar screen, and we've got to get them back there. They have dropped off from where they were... We had voting rights well, bill. We had well, 60s. We had uh, war on poverty, which went a long way toward trying well, to address some of those things before it got sabotaged by Vietnam War and that kind of thing. But think but in even more mundane terms. Yeah. Um, we don't have much in the way of an effort to uh, provide affordable housing in our society. The cost yeah. of college tuition has skyrocketed relative to people's income. People come out of college with a huge debt. People are losing, and, and some people can't even go to college in right. the first place if yeah. they can't afford it. Mm. People are... Uh, losing health care coverage or seeing their benefits diminish. People are seeing their yeah. pensions evaporate. So, and, and, and we're seeing more and more jobs um, that are being converted f from regular full-time jobs to part-time or contractual employment. So we've got more economic insecurity. Working people, middle-class people are struggling h harder uh, economically. Uh, it's harder and harder to put your kids through college. It's harder and harder to find affordable housing. and and, and yet we have tax cuts for the very wealthy. 1.7 uh, trillion, I think, was the yeah. hallmark of uh, this current administration yeah. that really set so the pace. So that really tells you where the priorities are in, in the political realm, and we've got to, we've got to really uh, have a conversation in this country and a political conversation <laughs> about whether that's the kind of society that we really think we are. And I think Katrina has driven home the fact that a lot of Americans don't think that's who we should be. Well, it would be. We have a traditional two-party thing. We have Democrats and Republicans, and then a few Trotskyites and things like that on the side. But that's the thing. Was and Nader, it was Nader the Democrats. Was a I beg your pardon? Nader was a Trotskyite. I don't think so. No, no, the Trotskyites <laughs> are bleed on themselves. God bless them. They can parse out the how many uh, the angels can dance on the end of a dialectic, materialistic uh, interpretation. But is it, but you have that. But it's the Democrats. And it's the Democrats have... Uh, 
uh, gone along with, perhaps if you think about it, that $1.7 trillion tax cut. They went along and voted for the war to go into Iraq. They gave them carte blanche. I mean, it's not as though it's just the Republican. It's uh, the Democrats, oh, yeah, too, the have Democrats to take have a considerable they've, amount they've gone of... Uh, along with a lot. They've been intimidated. They've been accommodationists. Um, I think they've been struggling to get their sea legs with the American electorate. And uh, I do think we're seeing uh, them begin to get more fortitude. But, uh, you know, to have all the fortitude that we need in a robust system, people have to vote for both sides. So we're, mm -hmm. um, you know, the truth of the matter is, when you think about it, we've only had three, Dem we have had three terms of Democratic presidents since 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, so the country has definitely taken a move certainly to the center and beyond the center toward the mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been going on for quite a while. And I don't think anybody would say that Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton were raving liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. the country, this is a centrist country, but mm -hmm. I think in the context of it being a centrist country, the question is, are we also a compassionate country? And I, I have been worrying that we have uh, developed a social conscious deficit disorder in mm -hmm. our society, mm -hmm. and we've got to be jogged out of that. Now, maybe Katrina has been the wake-up call. It really was something else to watch. All of those it's faces incredible. there that it were just, incredible. it was such incompetency and so incredible. forth, and such a... Uh, such callousness. Uh, yeah, such kind. It may be also, they had the, uh, if I may, we just keep it, uh, we're talking national, but we're also, t we're in an international context. There was a huge demonstration on the 15th of February, was it, in a couple of years back when they were going to go to war in Iraq, and there were people all over the world, New York Times, where you used to hang right. your hat, uh, famously had the occasion, they said there are two superpowers in the world, the United States of America and world public opinion that is in opposition, and that is, as I get it from people coming in from around the world, is... Uh, Unfortunately, the case that a great number of people, the masses, if you want, of the world, are very, very uh, predisposed toward not liking very much what the United States of America is increasingly standing for. Well, interestingly enough, I mean, David Brooks in the, the op-ed columnist in the Times, mm -hmm. and then also, I forget the name of the fellow, but the, there was a, an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine mm -hmm. just this last Sunday about the fact that aren't we all Americans? I mean, what Katrina, whether you think about it as race or whatever, what, mm. what Katrina revealed is mm -hmm. that we, we don't think of ourselves as, as all in the same boat. Um, and, um, you know, the fundamental role of government is to protect all Americans from certain emergencies and exigencies that are beyond their capacity to deal with. And, and this crisis revealed that, that many folks in government don't see it that way. They the, don't see the it hurricane. that way. The hurricane. Yeah. They don't see it politically that way. And, and they don't see government functioning all that well on behalf of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that's been a wake-up call to the American people. I mm -hmm. hope it has been. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that conversation is going to continue through the midterm elections next year and will probably continue on into 2008. I think so. You've been involved in the realm of civil rights. And right. uh, you were with the Ur National Urban League, which is perhaps a premier urban uh, civil rights uh, vehicle for helping people get into the mainstream, particularly. Well, focused on economic as and well as economic issues. And NAACP has been great on, on legal issues, so we kind of yeah. so we kind of complement each other. You do. Yeah, yeah, you got that. You got the, the, the thing. But then, but you also are very uh, cognizant of the fact that it's really good if we can get some people in the board, on the board of directors of our right. major companies and right. maybe into CEO positions right. of major, and that sort of thing. You're helping people into the mainstream in a away so you're aware of that but what came out so well and I was watching it without even being aware of it and so what I realizing here's all these faces of destitute people and they were all black and brown so the race issue is still very very much part of what uh, Gunnar Myrdal called the great American dilemma you must have a sensitivity to that having been involved in the civil rights uh, vineyard well, certainly the, the f images we saw were um, overwhelmingly black and brown. There's plenty of white folks who are caught yeah. up in the same thing. Yeah, a lot yeah. of the people in the nursing homes, a lot of the people I saw, you know, uh, refuge, you know, people who ha had been, uh, who had left the nursing homes and were resting on the conveyor belts in the airports mm -hmm. were, were white as well. I, th I mean, I think it's important to recognize the ethnicity of those who got stranded, but beyond that question per se, what was clear is that the haves got out and the haves got stuck there. And, and I think that was a function of a government at the, certainly at the federal level, not placing as much value on have-nots as, as it should and not mobilizing to make sure that, that everything was done to try to keep people out of harm's way and move them out of harm's way. And, and uh, 
And so we didn't have the kind of leadership at the federal level. We had a, uh, you know, federal emergency agency that was kind of a joke in this capacity. It was a joke, all headed by, you know, political yeah, uh, yeah. appointees. So, yeah. and, and you do that when you really don't believe that the job of government is to do a good job. Uh -huh. um, so again, that's a wake-up call to everybody yeah. in this country, and we've just got to be sure that we're real clear about that. And that's, yeah. that's why mm -hmm. the job of a citizen in this day and age is not just to say, well, I'll take somebody's word for it. It's mm -hmm. to look at the facts and mm -hmm. reach your own conclusion about what you see. Don't and bother me read. with the facts, Mr. Fry. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the facts. Yeah, it's true. Right. It's like that. But it, hasn't it always been, you know, I was just back and reading, hasn't it always been throughout all of, we've been here 200,000 years, we're all out of Africa, that sort of thing, and you look at the course of civilization in the, in the Roman Empire, there were a few people who ran everything. A third of the people were slaves. In Athens, even the time of Pericles, there were slaves. We've had the feudal period where we had serfs wallowing around in the mud while a few ran things. And it's always been a few people who have run things for their own interests against others who would compete about who's going to. So it's always been like that. But, Is but there the a genius, possibility of a new birth of freedom for everyone in a way the that of is America, characteristic of the modern experience? The genius of America is that we have thought of ourselves and structured our laws so that middle class people and working class people get a pretty good shake as well. They sure have. You not know, so sure that's going to hold. We struck, well, but that, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's, that's what the debate, that's the big the question right now. Absolutely. That's the way it mm -hmm. has been now. Yeah. You know, with civil rights and the Brown versus Board of Education right. decision, uh -huh. we let African Americans into that game. Women, <laughs> we let women, <laughs> we let women in. into we let the game. We let them vote in 1920. But the, basically Finally. we said working people, middle class people, we're going to make this country work for you. And it has. And it has. And that's what's at risk now it is that's that's what's be. at risk and that's what that's what we as a nation have to decide we don't we're, we're going to put a stop to that being placed at risk we put a stop to the tax cuts that are tilted toward the very very wealthy leaving government crippled in its ability to deal with starved the beast, some people and, say. Uh, yeah so that's yeah. that's what that's Northwest, what the american yeah. people have to decide whether this is the kind of nation we want and um, uh -huh. i think katrina has really been a wake-up call I think it has. It really is focused. That I was raised in Detroit, and Detroit was there. In fact, I was raised in Detroit. My mother, my maternal grandmother, uh, the house where my mother was and everything, Henry Ford was, as a young man, 12, 13 years old, tinkered in their garage in mm. Detroit before he built this great thing. We had an assembly. We had a great you know, bur burst of energy, Edison. We had all kinds of things. Right. And then that all came to focus. A lot of people came from the South. A lot of people came from agriculture, went into the factories. Five dollars a day. People could buy a car. The thing got going. After the Second World War, it was a great time for a great, great number of people. Yeah. Have one job. You go. You could build into the middle class. The middle class was really gl growing, and it made a lot of sense. I just saw a piece a little a couple weeks, a couple months ago, in your New York Times, the New York Times, and it had a thing, and it said that the wealth distribution in the United States is that the super rich are separating themselves from the rest of society in alarming proportion, and all of the money is going to the super wealthy, even just differentiating it themselves from the wealthy, much less the middle the or lower people. That, that's it's becoming almost feudalistic. That's a way to look at it, and, mm -hmm. and, and we've got to look at it that way. The other way to look at yeah. it is something like only 8% of kids from low-income families get to go to college, whereas 70 some odd percent of the kids from the upper income families get to go. That's very that's skewed, that's isn't very it? Skewed. Yeah. Um, I, so I think another thing, way to look at it is what is happening, regardless of what's happening to the extraordinarily wealthy, mm -hmm. what's happening to working people and middle class people and mm -hmm. poor people? Mm -hmm. um, is it harder or easier to send your child to college? It's harder. Um, are more people losing their health benefits? Is housing less affordable? I mean, I read the other day that, that um, there was a 12% decline in the number of affordable housing units in Washington, D.C. No, last really? year alone. Oh, my God, and it had been terrible last before that. Last year alone yeah, because yeah. of all the gentrification that's going uh -huh, on. Yeah. And there are no public policies to cushion the blow. Mm -hmm. um, people are losing their pensions. Those are the things that, regardless of what's happening At to the, the super wealthy, yeah. what's the fate of those in the middle? What's right. the fate of people who are working to keep this country uh, functioning? And we've got to make sure that this society works for them. Oh, right. And that there's a pathway to the middle class and middle even class. into the maybe upper middle and class for increasing the numbers of people. Down in that's New the Orleans. Urban League has been involved yeah, with that's, that that's heavily. Been, yeah, that's been the, yeah. been the job. Right. And you look at the number of people who, even though, even people who are working in New Orleans, you know, hardly earning any money. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. So um, uh -huh. we've got we we just we we've we've got some big questions that we're going to have. We to do, and it, it's time for a na real national dialogue. Yes, do you it think is. it'll be able to come to the surface by midterm elections or there will be... Uh, I think it's working its way to the surface. Yeah. 
and then we got we got yeah, that kind of thing. It's it's going that way. It floated to the, I hate to use it. It floated to the surface down in. Floated Orleans. to the bad. Among uh, many unfortunate other things. analogy, a lot of <laughs> other things too. It really was a mess. I couldn't yeah. believe it was so but anyway, inept. Yeah. And then there's all the war thing, the Iraq yeah. thing, that kind of stuff, the national policy. If there is this problem, we had that thing for after the Second War, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then somehow we got to the 80s, PAPCO. We've only got about 8%, as I understand it, 8% of our private sector employees now are unionized. The unions are in disarray in terms mm -hmm. of representing the workers' rights in terms of that. And in, in Detroit, my grandfather was a union organizer at the turn of the century, but the unions and the organized effort on the part of the working people of this country seem to be in disarray and at the hands of the finance people uh, increasingly. And what do you, is, 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 well, is, am people, I right in well, that? Well, I, I don't. I don't only are union no, I know, right I know that there's been a sharp drop in union mm -hmm. membership. And mm -hmm. uh, someone I know who knows the union situation well says that in part it's because, frankly, the unions haven't been as attentive to the broad array of needs of, of workers as they should have been. They've mm -hmm. been very focused on compensation wages, issues, yeah. wages, mm -hmm. but not focused on the larger child care needs, lifestyle needs, et cetera, that people are thinking about. And so if, you, if, if an employer responds better to those and adequately to compensation, then, then the union may struggle with that. And mm -hmm. obviously the labor movement, as I say, I don't know a lot about those issues. The labor movement's got some moments of truth coming up because it's, uh, it's been losing sway, and, uh, and that impacts, obviously, the whole tilt in American it politics. It, it impacts a whole lot of people, including even nowadays the teachers as a union. They were, in my old days, they weren't yeah. unionized. They were professional. Right. And the professional thing right. uh, was that you don't have the lawyers unionized. You don't have right. the doctors unionized. And so we have these professional people. But that is a problem about the people with less advantaged people. And there's somewhere in the, the Gospels or something, take care of the least among you and among some of our political thinking, I think is there by a lot of people like Voltaire and others have said that kind of thing. We are not sufficiently taking uh, account of the whole of the society and are inordinately concentrating upon those that are already very well uh, we established. Like I mean, uh, there, there are situations where workers are given a choice of union, non-union, and they go non-union because mm -hmm. they feel there's a better, you know, their circumstances would be better with, without it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's some real challenges for unions. Yeah. Um, but I, again, this is not an area of any expertise much. But, but that's part of the national dialogue about how right. that's going to be done. We, we had, we have, you were involved with, um, with um, I think you're involved on the board at Verizon, if I'm right. not mistaken, and you kept track of things uh, in the thing, uh, in terms of communication. We had a Communications Act of 1934 that stood the, you know, that stood the statue basis in the Congress uh, for communications. And then right. there was the need, or felt the need to be a fundamental uh, revisitation of the basic principles embodied in that constant in that piece of legislation which uh, structured the ground rules for the a uh, large thing communications industry in 1996 and it's even being examined now and so forth if you get back to something as basic as for instance in a world where there's increasing technological capability to produce things and so forth you get back to a thing that the basic, what would be the basic policy grounding statement of the governmental system out of history that we're emerging from in terms of basic broad ideas of, of organi economic organization of a society. It seems to me it would be the Employment Act of 1946 is the basic policy grounding statement in terms of the structure by which our, we're going to contemplate the economic development of this society. And is there a need for there to be an investigation of the basic policy grounding statements, as there was for the communication industry and other things, to deal with the altered uh, zeitgeist or the altered uh, realities that are coming out of history, which have changed so fundamentally that we need a basic look at the policy grounding statements by which our societies to be organized in a very large system well, way, or is that I reaching too far? Well, just got to be careful what you can realistic. Think hard about what you can realistically impact. I mean, I, I believe very profoundly that we ought, to, we ought to structure our society around opportunity. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that if, if, if you work, you should be able to earn a decent living. So you've got to think about the, the adequacy of the minimum wage, which I, I think I've heard is, you know, purchases less now than it did 30 years ago. About 515, I think. I don't know how you could live on it. absurd that yeah. it should be yeah. value, you know, much less value. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at pensions and retirement protection. You've got to look at health care. Um, 
you've got to look at the fundamentals of being able to live uh, a decent life. Secondly, I think we've got to look at the quality of our education system. We've got a long way to go. There's been a lot of pressure on schools to improve, but not enough attention to what happens inside the classroom, and certainly not enough attention to making sure that all the teachers inside the classrooms are as able as they need to be and as well trained as they need to be and, and given the maximum chance to succeed that they need. We, we're not still not remotely serious enough about improving uh, our K-12 system. Mm -hmm. And then I think we've got to look at the uh, access and affordability in higher education. I mm -hmm. mean, it boggles the mind that in a country that you know pioneered the idea of the land-grant college, yeah. if you're motivated and you want to get higher education, we'll make sure you get it and it won't cost yeah. you a dime yeah. because yeah. we realize yeah. that some folks can't City afford it. City University used to be free. Sure. Yeah, it was sure. damn good school. Sure. A lot of good sure. stuff happened. Not free yeah. anymore. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, for families that mm -hmm. can't afford to take out a loan of you know ten, twelve thousand dollars a year to send their child through, that child's not going to get to go to school. Right. That doesn't make any sense in uh -huh. an opportunity society. So right. I think we've got to look at the the fundamentals of an opportunity society and make sure that those building blocks are in place. Think think about the impact that the GI Bill had on our society. Fantastically it's beneficial, fantastic. almost as good fantastic. as FHA, I think, fantastic. or the Homestead Act. But that was FHA a step is in that another record. Yeah. So I think we need to look at the building blocks of an opportunity society, make sure we, we move policy toward them to make them more fully accessible to everybody and not uh, allow a retreat, which is what's happening now. We have retreated from that. We had Mr. Franklin Roosevelt. We got Social Security voted the year I was born, thank God. And we brought a, a basic bond you know, for a whole lot of people and that sort of thing is there. But there are people attacking that now, and it seems to be that we, we reached a certain point. I, w I would say it just came right around about 1980 when they busted PAPCO, and when mm -hmm. they, they went into a different kind of trend line, and that was a high point. And we have, we, we don't pay teachers much, we don't pay attention much to those kind of things. That We're paying teachers better, but we don't pay them nearly enough in order to attract people who, you know, really are drawn to the profession. And and everybody in the, I mean, if, if you're an adult, you mm -hmm. ought to be able to teach in New York and, and live like an adult without having to live with your parents or room with people you don't know. People are doing <laughs> that more and more. Yeah. And I that, mean, that even people are having that, to team up like uh, college student uh, people right. or something. That, does, that doesn't make any sense. Uh -huh. And all sorts of people who would be drawn into the profession just won't, won't do that. So I think we've got to think about the fundamentals, the building blocks of an opportunity society. And one of them, of course, is you know access to high quality preschool. There are just some things we know. The other thing is, while we want to promote ownership, and I think more people need to own their own homes, more people need to own their own businesses, we've got to be careful of this rhetoric about promoting an ownership society because yeah. if we're not careful, an ownership society means that if you have a problem like you can't get out of New Orleans, you own that problem. Yeah, you own, yeah, 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 you own <laughs> the bad. As well you as own the, the problem. If, yeah, if yeah, you don't all have health care, you up to the own individual. the problem. Right, if right. you don't have enough of attention, you yeah. own the problem. Yeah, that's and, part of their uh, accountability. You're on your own. The accountability so, seems to only apply so to the people that are in tight I, circumstances. I think we need to be, you know, really espouse opportunity, make opportunity accessible, and 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 really make sure that the fundamentals of a sh uh, sort of shared opportunity and shared obligations are in place. And I think those have been shredded, and we got to got to put them back together. How are we going to do it? Uh, Social Security is in good shape. Do you think it's under serious threat by the seems to be the retreat from the idea of trying to attack Social Security? I think that I think the president's plan is uh, I don't want to call it stillborn, it sort of but still it, ain't born, go, yeah. it ain't going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Social Security's been the most successful program that's been established. It lifted to bring some for you know we had we had elderly people who devoted their lives to building this economy who at the died end of their the working gutter. lives died yeah. in the gutter. And they did poor. in the 30s. Social it was awful. Security is the best anti-poverty program we've seen. Right. And, uh, and so it's been hugely successful. Could you help me out a little on this? Social Security, because you talk Social Security, uh, that, that is funded by FDIC, I mean, where they're paying taxes into a fund and so forth, and it's secure now for a long time ahead and so forth. But the basic policy grounding statement, again, is the out of the Second World War, is the Employment Act of 1946. I don't know if there's another one that sets out the context by which we see the society is going to be organized. Well, s but Social th Security that predated says, that, though. But, uh, but, but that Employment Act said that it essentially what we're going to do is almost going to be the, the full Employment Act of 1946, but we are going to distribute income to the masses of the people through employment, through a... Uh, yeah, what I'm, what I'm, I don't know that that Employment Act had any teeth in it, though. I mean, you can't legislate full employment. 
No, but that's the goal. Oh, right. That's right. the context. Right. We're going to right. distribute it. Now, if you look at a certain thing and you say on a, con on a, if I may, philosophically or something, if you look at the input to actual production through time, right. in Tom Jefferson's day, a guy had a hammer and a piece of leather. It took him 12 hours to make a pair of boots and so forth. But all of the non-labor aspects to production was not in very great uh, uh, prominence. Now you've gone to where it's something other than human labor, whether physical or intellectual human labor that's contributing to production, uh, patent rights, uh, you know, uh, technology, land, all these kind of things that are owned very often in a society by corporate stock, and that is owned by a relatively small group. We have a very small base in terms of the people that own the, all the corporate assets right. that are increasingly responsible for right. production. and. Uh, is it possible? Also, there's the undercutting of labor by software programs that can do what labor has had to do, but it's maybe only it's gone from 10% was labor, uh, other than labor, in the uh, Tom Jefferson time. Some people, I've seen charts, and it's a projection, you know, that it's only maybe something 20, 10, 20% of the actual production is labor, but we're going to distribute all the income by labor and leave the ownership of all the assets that are responsible for wealth creation to those people like we did to feudal but lords. There are, there are things you can do to legislate opportunity. You can legislate affordable preschool. You can legislate affordable and accessible health care. You can legislate uh, minimum wages that increase in value over time, don't evaporate in the face of inflation. You can legislate affordable, as I say, higher education. You can legislate um, affordable housing with with supports for families that are uh, that are poor there are things that can be done that we don't have the gumption or ideological commitment to do now that we used to and we need to revisit and get get back on the page there and you can reallocate resources you can look at the tax revenues and say well instead of providing a tax cut to the extraordinarily wealthy in our society we can use some of that same money to make these other things that we can legislate more affordable mm -hmm. for people. And that's, that's where I think the American people really have to engage and ask what kind of society do we want? Do we want this to be an opportunity society or do we want it to be an exclusive club? Opportunity to have a job? They got opportunity ultimately to have a job. Is there going, and, and, and should the idea of ownership I don't because know how those assets are owned by someone, and somebody who's got a, a good, healthy amount of stock ownership in our major corporations has income coming to them because they ownership they have ownership over technologically oriented productive systems, which are increasingly responsible in a right. ratio with labor. You have to. You so do the you ownership you thing shouldn't be preempted by somebody on the right if if this is actually. The, the, the something other than human labor is increasingly responsible for production. The ownership of those that are the way things are actually being produced should somehow be filtrated like the well, uh, I, I homestead got some land to people I when land was want important. But economic policies that promote healthy economic activity that create jobs. I think you got to buttress that though with legislation which says if that jobs have to pay decent wages, they have to provide decent benefits. And we're going to have we're going to have the underpinnings of opportunity, which you know we're going to have preschool, decent K-12 education, and affordable higher education, and you know training for people. I don't know that you can legislate the creation of a job, but you can have policies that promote economic growth. So, I I would focus on on on, on robust because you know the best anti-poverty program in addition to social security is a tight labor market that creates lots of jobs, and if you can have lots of jobs that are good jobs that that have decent benefits, then people move forward. And that's certainly what we saw in the latter part of the 1990s. Um, but I just think we've, well, we've, okay, we've, yeah. we've sort of not wanted to talk about these things. We've wanted to pretend that people aren't poor, if they're you know, out of sight, out of mind, et cetera. And, uh, and I, I think that's what we're going to have to have uh, national dialogue. OK, about. good. And that, that we will distribute income to the people through their labor participation and production. Well, you are using that word. I, dis distribution of jobs, they call income. it. Income. I, I, Not I am ownership of capital assets. I'm will that well, be I'm held for the few? Well, you're, yeah. you're laying a little more ideology on this than I want to. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. I don't, uh, what I want to be sure of is that yeah. people who participate in the economy have uh, good standards of living, good opportunities. Absolutely. And we make sure that the society works for them. If a handful of people are doing pretty well, 
up at the top. I'm not sure how much we can slice off the top, but we certainly don't have to rejigger tax policy to give them more than they need. Those folks That's will be we wealthy. Just did. Oh yeah, I know, I know. That's what we just did. And just got everything Those skewed. folks will be wealthy whether they get a tax cut or not. And these people want to say the government is the problem. Get yeah, government yeah. off your back. The government mm -hmm. that gives you something to the less advantage is in right. and this market right. fundamentalism is in the right. saddle. I just would and like it's very to dangerous. Focus on the fundamentals of opportunity. Yeah, right. And keep right. an opportunity to decide. Right. We did some things in the in the and the, and the, this is what the Urban League has been involved. This is what you were involved with actually throughout what you what you've been doing the urban league's been focused on that well when was the heyday when the society was structured in a way as far as the national economy let's say in your view that was favorably predisposed with things going on in the, the zeitgeist and the, the legislative environment and so forth that was favorable would it have been in the mid 60s when the war in poverty was being advanced the voting rights act and all these kind of things we've seen it well we've seen a following the tax cut that mr heller and mr well we've uh, seen a kennedy several economic heyday certainly one of the most robust ones was coming out of world war ii and yeah. in through the 50s yeah um and that was great for society writ large problem was that you know black folks and women weren't in the game so the f struggle with civil rights was movement was to blast open that door and get everybody into the game. Um, we got a long way to go that way yet. Still. Yeah, but there was a there was a great surge forward. People got homes, they got jobs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, more recently, the most recent time that we've seen it was in the latter part of the 1990s under Bill Clinton, yeah. uh, where w again we saw a very tight labor markets, lots of jobs being yeah. created. Mm. Growth in earnings, record lows re in unemployment rates among African Americans. Yeah, et no inflation for a long period of right. time. It was really um, so. Uh, but we've just and 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 uh, a hard drive toward a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, that seems <laughs> to have gone right out the window. That's Remember how they the used window. to talk about the deficits stock market as far as you can see. Yeah. The deficits are growing. It's just yeah, like it's all so out the window as we, far as we've the just got to you know we we we've got to get back to a disciplined discussion of that and, uh -huh. and again I hope that the American people having looked at what's happened with the Iraq war having looked at what's happened with the hurricanes having looked at what's happened with tax policy don't just you know take somebody's word for uh -huh. it and will instead develop the tools to think critically about what's going on and when we uh, do do you think there will be political leadership that can really effectively address this in a way because again like it seems to me that the so-called loyal opposition has been very moribund or yeah, at least I, I mean, I think, I think in the build up, I think in the build up to uh, um, maybe this the is midterm elections and the next election. Well, we'll see who surfaces. We don't yeah, know right. Who will surface them? But we it know all the names. We'll see how they surface. This I candidate. think that's right. Yeah, and it's going to be public opinion. will have to help set the context where something other right. than just going right. along is there, and that may be what's uh, what's what's blown in the wind now. Yeah. Yeah, and if there is institution like the urban affair, I mean the uh, urban league and that sort of thing, will be institution where that would would that would come up. What about an international scale? The United States has set itself up in a lot of people's minds. They've got this war in Iraq. They've got a big thing. China's looming. Do you think the position of the foreign policy as far as the United States has anything that is uh, uh, important, should be addressed in terms of critical thinking and so forth? We've been talking mostly domestic. What do you think on the foreign, well, this is domestic not my the foreign front? Not my, um, forte by any stretch of the mm -hmm. imagination. I just have some reactions as a citizen. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm just, you know, what's happened in Iraq is is absolutely heartbreaking mm -hmm. to have gone in based on what appear to be either egregiously faulty intelligence or false pretenses or, or, or worse. Mm -hmm. um, it's, just, uh, it's just horrific. And uh, to have it not go well is horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and how we extricate ourselves from that situation uh, with some dignity and leaving a country intact remains to be seen. We don't really know. Uh, I've heard people say that we're up against an insurgency the likes of which we've never faced before. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, <laughs> looking back on it, help mm -hmm. but wonder, mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't there a, a price at which Saddam Hussein wouldn't have become our friend again? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he was probably available cheap. A lot cheaper than this war, <laughs> and uh, well, so I it's, you know I just I just don't know. I think that the damage that's been done to our reputation around the world is just um, is just awful. And there are parts of the world now that were basically contact, virtual contact between the West and and uh, the Middle East has been shut off in, 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 in the Muslim world. And I think that's very very sad. Um, how we repair that, and what will take, what kind of leadership, what kind of 
hard work, what kind of diplomacy it'll take to repair that, I don't know. I think that if things can continue to move forward in a constructive direction in uh, with the Israeli and Palestinian situation, mm -hmm. that will help. Um, but I think we've got a lot. We've got a lot of a lot of work to do. The the most one of the most interesting essays I've read about terrorism was an interview in Newsweek magazine with the um, so the former premier of Singapore, mm -hmm. this grand fellow whose name I forget, yeah. who said that the best way to fight terrorism is that you've got to do it in c close conjunction with allies who got the problem in their own soil because they've got to root it out. You can't drop bombs on right. those right. those cells. The, your, mm -hmm. the, the folks who are living with it on a day-to-day -day basis have to go dig it out. Yeah. And um, and we didn't pursue this this war that way. Um, on economic competition, I mean, I think I think our country is going to have to get ready for the day when China is a major, major economic power. I mean, it's mm -hmm. obviously coming on like gangbusters. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I were blessed to be able to go over there. In oh, you've been two thousand. Yeah, we uh -huh. spent about three weeks in China, mm -hmm. and it's it's a mind-boggling yeah site. It's going incredibly eight, nine percent a year. Very or? determined, yeah. very sophisticated. Um, society. Many aspects of it is first world as ours. Many aspects mm -hmm. of it third world. But mm -hmm. it's it's coming on like gangbusters, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it's it's already a force to be reckoned with. And I think we're only getting a glimpse of what the future is e going to economically, gonna yeah, economically, Listen, and, and 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 from that will probably flow of flexing of political muscles. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, yeah because it, it is a major thing. Have you seen the ti the Epic Times, that new newspaper around town now? No. That's a that's a thing that critiques very seriously by Chinese, the Chinese whole Chinese government uh -huh. communist system, uh -huh. and said that it's uh, based upon just egregious human rights violations, that kind of thing. So that's part of the dialectic of whether or not they're going to be able to keep that, and then that's built against the implosion of the Soviet Union. A lot of things going right. on, uh, you know, a lot of things going going on. But in you look at India, China. Uh, two incredibly populist, very yeah. focused, very determined societies. Those two are coming on uh, like gangbusters. Well, they the got years. a long way to go. I just saw a fellow on Charlie Rose, he's finance minister for India. He said they got 250 million people in India who live under one dollar a day. Yeah. How the hell somebody can subsist on one dollar a day? These things are all measured by GDP and that kind of thing, and there's right. other realities. But, but it doesn't take the mobilization of all of them to give us heartburn economically, though. And I don't know. I've ne I, I don't know him well. Did a program Jude Winiski. I don't know if right. you're familiar with the father of supply side. That kind of thing. Right. He's not exactly what I cotton to in terms of economic theory. But he had a PC place. He just passed. I'm sad to say. He was a major intellectual. And he just passed a couple of weeks ago. But he had an article where he had printed, he said he didn't know why ha Saddam Hussein was in the dock at all. Mm -hmm. He had an argumentation for that, that uh, that was probably something that was really skewed in terms of the reality. He had supported us against Khomeini and, the, you know, the kind of That's thing. That's why I think we probably could have bought him off. Yeah, again, bought again, him off or, or even or third worked time. with him, and it makes you wonder well, that's what... That's what I mean by work with him. Yeah, I mean yeah, yeah, I see what you mean, yeah, right, write, right, write bring, bring him on board, <laughs> bring him on board, right? So to speak, yeah. But that's the thing you'd want to do if we could get find something where there could be commonality, and that probably applies to uh, most all of the problems. You want to involve people, and ideally, if you could, you would want to involve everybody in a way where uh, you can you can have a happy non-zero sum kind of thing. That book by Robert Wright is interesting, where he said non-zero sum. That the the because we live in a time of absolutely incredible capability to provide for uh, through the technological extensions. Just as we live at a time where Michio Kaku and uh, Joshua Lederberg and others and uh, Jonathan Shell will tell us that the weapon systems that exist are of such dimension now, after 200,000 years, 10,000 generations, we've finally reached the point where if they were unleashed, it would apparently mean the end of the whole damn right. species. Well, and now well, they're juggling also, these well, things. Well, and the scary thing is we live in a time where there are terrorists around the world who would like to kill uh, tens of thousands of Americans and In really destabilize our society. That's so right. They would, and they see this society is being an evil society right. in terms of things that right. grew out of that. You know, we're the great superpower, and people are now seeing us as the, as though we're in the Versailles Court of Louis the Sixteenth in terms of some change that's called for well, in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, of the zeitgeist. And we have a technologically induced, that's all extension of our consciousness, that technology is, and the capability of doing Now we've got this, int this intellectual extension of our central nervous system with the computers and so forth. 
And that also has a tremendous, maybe equally significant, uh, existentially significant capability of taking care of the people of the world in which it has historically not been right. available right. to us, do you think? We, we live in an ex existentially particularly interesting time that the Chinese always warned against having to live in. But these are times where you can destroy the whole species, and we might be able right. to make a, a thing where you, know, you get toward on, liberation. On that note, I, um, over the summer I read this new book about uh, Robert Oppenheimer called American Prometheus, and it's yeah. quite a remarkable book about how many of the scientists who were involved in developing the weaponry had, uh, you know, were haunted by the fact that they'd done it for the rest of their lives. And uh, that genie's uh, out of the bottle. Yeah, the genie's out of the bottle. Now, one of the things I would hope is that we can use not not that technology but other technologies i i have little doubt that if we wanted to make cars that got 75 miles to the gallon we could do it why don't we do it well i don't why know why don't we you you <laughs> know, I, i'm i'm sure we could do it if yeah. we decided that we were going to do it could i share something with sure. you we had a fellow in here the other really nice guy you may know him because he's a major lawyer and so his name is eric peterson Definitely. with an s-e-n uh -huh. major law firm he wrote a book on thomas jefferson really a good book mm -hmm. we did a program came out He's a major law firm, so he would be one of your, you know, abogatos, you know, mm -hmm. but he was really good. But his job is, he's in the late, ma apparently the major law firm in the city or in the world, I'm not sure, that handles uh, infrastructure contracts from mm -hmm. a legal perspective. And it was very interesting to me because he represents mostly municipalities mm -hmm. in a legal sense. And it's for major construction things, like highways and things like that. And they have three aspects to the way they handle that. It was interesting to me. One is design, mm -hmm. and the other one is build, and the other one is operate, major systems mm -hmm. that could bring this. And the idea that you have a design capability which is going to change through time is really interesting. If we have a gap between the design, we have a capability, an unutilized capability in a design sense to do things that have been we couldn't have skyscrapers before mr otis invented the elevator right he votes right. the elevator so you do it you can't right. have roads until mr ford gets so the chain the time changes that we have a design capability as we sit here and to, to bring cars that give her that kind of mileage or uh, change but the the quality the, the challenges between our de our capability our design yeah, capability of taking care of everything and the inherited institutions that make so we don't have systems that allow us to do which well, we from a design the sense we, we, don't, well, we sense, don't have we know we can do that's inherently schizophrenic we, we, we don't have the political will i mean i i suspect that uh, another way one could deal with the tax code is we could incent behavior we could incent the automobile manufacturers to start to make those kinds of they cars. may do it some people say the automobile the well, price of gasoline is going to make well, a lot it, of incentive it may that's for one way things. to do it yeah. but we could accelerate yeah. the change by incenting the automobile i mean that's one thing i'd like to see it done yeah. in the tax code is is incent that and we could also incent behavior by consumers uh you know if you gave people a, a, a deep tax deduction for cars they purchase they get Hybrid, more than 50 yeah. miles and or 70 miles to the yeah. gallon uh -huh. you'd see that behavior change in a minute if you gave accelerated <laughs> write-offs to the development of new plant and equipment to build these cars to uh -huh. the automobile industry, that would get their attention. But uh -huh. we don't do that. Well, okay. Um, now the I question think we're going to have the to. question of the hour. Now we only have a couple of minutes right. left. Is why don't we do? It? And are we in a situation where we have a capability that our inherited systems won't allow us to realize in a let's say systems way of providing for everybody in a really good way? And if it is, that would be front and center in terms of this national and international we don't dialogue have, we, don't we should be entering into. We don't perhaps. have the political will. We developed it's the, the politi political will. We developed the political will after the energy crisis in the early 80s. You remember yeah. that? Remember? Yeah. So we got to go back around that track again. Or Sputnik. Remember Sputnik? Yeah. You're too young to remember Sputnik. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, remember Sputnik? Oh, Everybody sure, was sure. all I thought out I was of become an engineer. They were bent out of. I almost went into engineering. Yeah. Could never read the slide rule. Right. But it. But does, I, yeah. I think the political will could develop again mm -hmm. and if if there were political leadership buttressed by political will we mm -hmm. don't have that now but i think we could we and could and the political it will could be one of the yeah. great job creation engines in our country uh uh alternative energy yeah. opportunities yeah. engineering uh think of all the new plants that would have to be made the new equipment that would have to be built the new cars that would be manufactured and sold there'd be all sorts of ways of creating a new energy uh, industry built on uh, energy efficiency yeah just as we saw a flowering of the retrofitting of houses and the insulation that's right. indus that's industry right. boomed in the, yeah. in the 1980s so uh -huh. you know may pr let let us hope that we're approaching a convergence of political 
will and and political power to do that you think it's political will and not design because design in that sense not only is design of the i think the design would happen overnight if the, there the, were the, the, the design would also be at the la level of thinking about the the broad structure of the society there's the there's car, a level the of design in terms of economic theory or in terms they of political they already theory. drive those cars in other parts of the world now they do Sure. They're ahead of us in other parts of the world. Oh, just go to Europe, see the size of the cars on I average. I stand for this. America's <laughs> got to be first in that kind of thing. There's all these kind of things that are happening. But the design, yeah, that's an interesting concept, design. The cap there's a gap between capability and uh, performance. And that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. Why is it that we're not able to do what we know we're collect now collectively able to do but we can't do it. So that political the will is the glue that political links the two. will because of <laughs> inherited institutions and inherited biases and that sort of thing. Yeah, so that and, would be and, and 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 lack of political mobilization on the part of the body politics. So maybe we on need it. new design of our political inst and economic institution. Or five dollar a gallon gasoline. Yeah, that would probably That'll do, do it. That'd do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, so good, so good, to, so good to talk to you. I tell you, but we do. Uh, it, it is time. I think I agree. With it. It's time for a dialogue in terms of maybe on broad, broad issues of things confronting the human condition. Because I got grandchildren now, and this sure. is a really challenging time on a large scale sense, particularly if you measure it against the long history we've been on this te our tenure on this earth. We're at a crucial time, and we ought to start calling upon our best minds and our best way of communicating. It's important we be able to communicate well, new this ideas isn't the, and so this forth. This isn't too. the 21st century we thought it was going to be. It isn't on the last day of 1999. It is isn't. It? This is not the 21st century <laughs> our grandfathers rejected at all. Than the one that we thought we were heralding. Well, uh, it's a it's five a, years ago. It's a synergetic world we live in, and it's a really interesting time. And it seems to me, if anyone's helped set the dialogue in a good way, that we should all repair to it's yourself. I Thank may you. say so. You've had Thank a distinguished you. career both in, in communication at the w, uh, you know, television and New York Times, and also the work at uh, the, uh, uh, the Urban League and, and uh, Rockefeller thank and that, you. and now continuing. And I really thank you very much for coming in and sharing your thoughts. It's really a great pleasure to thank welcome you. to the program. I just wish you all the best, and let's thank stay you. in touch. And thank we you. ought to make sure that we have systems of communication, too, that right. public right. access that allows us to talk about right. some of these things that may be just not necessarily uh, the, the, the accepted thing. But we need some new thinking in places where experiments and thinking can right. go on, don't you think? Right, right. yeah. OK, yeah. well, thanks a lot for coming. Thank Your you. pleasure. pleasure to have had his perception. We invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. So tune in. And uh, once again, Hugh, Bri uh, Hugh uh, Price, thank you really very much for coming in and for all your good, well-led life. And uh, may it continue in even more expansive proportions in the time ahead. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we're just running out those graphics and everything. Right. I just can't help thinking that we're going to have to do, we're going to have to, I think we're going to have to democratize ownership no, as happen. an income distribution system. Because one of the things, you do, people, people have needs. They don't have the meat. They don't have a way of getting income to buy. If you had it widely spread, like the Homestead Act, if you had it widely spread, there would be the market for what could be produced of these hybrid cars. I don't know. I don't know. That's just my hobby horse. But I mean, it's arguable that, that ownership is democratized now because you know millions of people own. Each yeah, of but these it's, a, it's it, they don't get income that way. It's all it's all just yeah. they're distributed but you know that's through. That's not going to happen. Though. You don't think that'll happen? You know, it's not going to happen. Can't happen. Uh, no. Probably not. Maybe but we should I forget about that one. But yeah, I, I mean, I just. I well, I mean, we'd throw it up in the air and think about yeah. it. Yeah. No, but I th I think mm. we can get changes in. I mean, just look at what's happened to the poll numbers. Look at what's happened. Absolutely, it's down to 38% yeah. in foreign Which policy is, now. Know, that's where Mr. Nixon. That's yeah. where Mr. Johnson was when he uh, resigned. Saying, remember? Wait a minute, time out. Something's yeah. not right. I think you're right. It's really going to be a, a broad-based uh, investigation. I just wish there was uh, sort of more of it, or got hurried, hasten the day when there's even more of it. In my view, but, you yeah. know, the election was nine months ago. Yeah, you're look right. What's happened? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's you're not right. Not like it just happened. It's, yeah. you know, it started four or five months after the election. People started yeah. waking up, and that's it's the getting key to thing. it's getting to a conspiracy patterns now. Well, I mean, this is people are waking up to what's going on. Yeah, and they have to develop the capacity for critical thinking. You can't just say just because some person on one side of the aisle or the other, whether it's Michael Moore or Bill O'Reilly, tells mm -hmm. you that such and such is so, doesn't make it so. Doesn't I mean, I can't watch any of that stuff yeah. anymore. Uh huh. You know, what do you, wh where do you get your?